Hi, this is Brendan Davis from Bedrock Games, and I'm here with Adam and Joel for another episode of, well, I guess this is, again, that gray area in the podcast where we're just covering <laughs> Terminator movies and we haven't given a name to what we're doing. So uh, we're going to be talking about Terminator 2 because we talked about the first Terminator. And um, and so uh, I guess I'll give a brief introduction to the movie and then we'll get into the discussion. Um, for those who don't know, Terminator 2 Judgment Day is a 1991 American science fiction action film directed by James Cameron. And it's follows up on the the first Terminator. And the first one was about Sarah Connor. This is about two Terminators being sent back to kill John Connor when he's a boy. And it pretty much follows, unless you guys want to dispute this, the same basic plot line as the first movie, but it approaches it in a very different way. Um, so I don't know, what, would you guys want to give your thoughts before we get into the discussion? I like first impressions, like when we first encountered it and that kind of thing. Just what, whatever you feel like talking about. We'll keep it really relaxed so that it's I, I think I was the champion of this one. I, I'm going to go first for a change. Um, okay. I, I grew up with Terminator 2. This was my action movie growing up. Um, and as a kid, this plays super, super good. Um, it's it's visuals are really striking. Like, uh, I especially was impressed with all the scenes where, like, uh, Arnold would like rip off some of his skin and they'd be like a robot hand underneath or something like mm -hmm. that. Like it's not presented in the horrifying way of the first one. It was very effective and scary in the first one here. It's shocking, but it's also like really rad. It's, it's, it's kind of presented in the robocopy way where it's more fun and cool. And uh, I think toyetic is the word they use for stuff like this. So this plays to a younger audience, I think. Which Wait, what is, was that uh, word? I, I've, not, I've not heard that word. Before. Oh, toyetic. What? Yeah, Toyetic. Toyetic is awesome, dude. That that's as a game designer, Toyetic is what you're going for. When and you so, what does Toyetic it. mean? Just so that we're all clear here. Uh, toyetic means whenever you can turn a concept into something that you can play with to have fun. You know, okay. like Castle Grayskull as a play set where He Man and his friends can fight. That's Toyetic as a concept. Okay. You know. Um, so yeah, and and this was a very toyetic movie. They made a lot of toys out of this. I should know. I owned some of the cooler <laughs> ones. Uh, I did. I I owned. There's one. There was one where you had like the cop version um, of the T1000, but he's got like the metal stabby hand. And then mm -hmm. if you press a button, he explodes. I'm pretty sure. Like his from the torso up, he just goes kaboom, and you have to put him back together, which was very T1000. And there was a really great one where you had a little metal uh, T101 skeleton that you would put inside a mold. And you would pump it full of this this flesh paste that would harden on it, and it would have like a little person outline over it that all the mm -hmm. muscles and all that. That was awesome. Uh, it worked yeah. correctly exactly one time. Then I ran out of the the powder stuff, and then I always had a T one hundred one after that. Uh, but one time, like I kept him in the skin for a long time, and then at one point I was moving his arms, and he was like ripping out of it, and I was like, "Now it's time for battle damage." So the one time that worked, it was the coolest toy I ever owned. Uh, didn't work for long, but man, when it did, it was cool. So, uh, so I th this movie has a very fundamentally different appeal than the than the first one. Even though I championed it, and it's my favorite one still. I am probably going to give it the silver medal of the franchise because the first one really is a better movie. I don't think that's even me who adores this one. I don't know that you can argue that this is a, a better movie. I don't think that'd be a sincere argument. Like if I'm really stacking them up, the first one is creatively brilliant. It's explosive. It's tight. Uh, it's got a really it's got an incredible vision and it realizes it incredibly well. The, the cast is stripped down to the bare minimum of what you need yeah. to make the movie work. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute firecracker. And this movie is, is bigger. It does more. It has a bigger budget. It has a bigger cast. It has a longer runtime and it doesn't feel bloated. All that stuff is fun and big and great, but it is what it is. This is a big blockbuster action movie and it just doesn't quite have the tightness or the genius of the first movie. It's good. And I think it's a worthy successor to the first one in almost every single way. But yeah, I'm going to give it the silver medal um, on this one after having watched both of them. But that's that's my general thoughts as when I was a kid, why I loved it, why I still love it, and kind of where I'm at now with it. Adam, how about you as you uh, finish <clears throat> right. water there? No, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, knew, I knew if my turn was coming up, I had yeah. to freshen up my throat. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, 
I come at it from a different angle because I was 19 when this came out. So I was in my cynical late teens by the by the time it came out. And I'm really glad Joel got me to watch this again, first of all. Let me say that because I had not gone back to watch this again since it was in the theater. I've just never sat down and watched it again. And I, I was disappointed in this movie because for me, Terminator was my big first you know, violent action movie. I mean, Terminator was huge to me. I I saw that. That was one of the first R movies I watched on video and blew me away. And this felt, it felt like, my, my memory of it was that it was a bigger budget kind of warmed over rehash kind of thing. And watching it again, I think I was a little unfair. I think there's a, a lot more going on here. I still have problems with it, which I will get into over the course of the podcast. But this is a good movie. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I still think the first one is better. I will. And, I, and I, the thing that's interesting is watching it again. I remember the experience of watching it the first time. And I was really enjoying this for 75% of the movie. And all of my problems with this movie are in the final act. Mm. And yeah, so it was kind of, and it, because, because of that, I watched the movie once, and that last 25% is what stuck in my memory and formed my opinion of it. Okay. So it's like, yeah, I, you know, I'll get into the problems later. I don't want to completely <laughs> go into go into my entire review at this point. But yeah, I, 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 the writing, the, like I mean, you, you, I think you comment on the writing, Joel. It's like this is a really well written movie too. I mean, and the action. I mean, I mean, not like you have to say, "Wow, I didn't realize Cameron was such a good action director." But uh, I, yeah, I really appreciated the direction in this. The acting is good. The performances are good. The relationships between characters are good. There's there's just a huge amount of stuff to like about this movie. So, yeah, I I this is this I my opinion has gone up hugely in this movie despite my my issues, which I'll, I'll wait I'll hold for now and, and give uh, Brendan a chance to talk. So I, I had a very similar experience to Adam. I'm I think about five years younger than Adam or four years. I'm not exactly sure. I was probably 14 or 15 when this came out. Um, I think I was in a freshman in high school, if I remember correctly, either freshman in high school or. Uh, you know, a senior in junior high. I don't know, one of the two. And I was really into Guns N' Roses. I was really into Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies. And this movie kind of marks like a dividing line when those interests, not that they went away, but when those interests started to wane a little bit. And uh, again, when it came out, I'm sure I loved it, but I just know that I always sort of associate T2 as like a really important dividing line in my like my timeline that I have in my head of like the timeline of my life and like all the things that I use to market T T2 is one of those things. Um, and I think it's kind of where like maybe both, I think it's because both guns and roses and Arnold Schwarzenegger almost Arnold Schwarzenegger was always a little bit of a self parody, but this is the point where he becomes even more of a self parody, I think. And I think it has to do with, he's got so much control creatively that he's able to do things like, no, I want a rock and roll soundtrack for this movie, which <laughs> I think, which I think in fairness worked, people liked it. Um, but it's one of the big tonal changes that makes it totally different from T1. Um, I think the other thing is T1 was this movie that we weren't supposed to see. Like, like Adam was saying, it was like our first <laughs> violent action movie. We were yeah. not supposed to be watching this movie. We snuck watching T1 and T2 was the movie that we were almost mandated to see. It was like society was <laughs> like, you must see this movie. And so it just had a different, I, it's almost like it took all of the things that were that we were rebelling against as young people and made them okay and cool. And that somehow made them less appeal. It, it's sort of like, it, like the, John, the John Connor character in this embodies that very well. He's kind of a Bart Simpson-like, Oh yeah, rebellious I young man. Directly to yeah. Bart Simpson while I was and, watching it, I was like, and oh, it's not <laughs> it's not authentic at all. Like nobody I knew behaved that way. People that were rebellious like that were like drinking beer and doing like real bad things. Not saying well, hasta la vista, baby. And you man, know, what I, mean? I got um, a lot to say about John Connor. We'll we'll get it to him. Um, <laughs> You're in the crosshairs yeah. again, Connor. Well, so here's the other thing. Terminator. The main character is Sarah Connor, and 
this movie is where this franchise kind of starts to lose sight of that. And I think that's where, and again, I don't blame this movie because I think it's ultimately more about John and his mother. So it kind of works, but Mm -hmm. I think the more they try to humanize John, John Connor, the less the movies work for me in general. This one I think is like the second most successful Terminator movie. But I, I think that like, this is the movie where the DNA gets set that starts to become a problem down the road in the later movies. If that makes sense. Every movie after this is some version of awful. Like the only one that's anywhere near even watchable is, um, what is that? Genesis? The one where it's like in the apocalypse. Like that one's, that one's watchable. It's not good. I I liked the third one. Actually, the third one didn't bother me so much. My second viewing, it didn't. The first time I saw it, it bothered me. I've only seen it. I've only seen it the one time and I, I despised it. So I was like, I can understand that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue. You know, I'm not going to die on the hill. I I might, well, Uh, I might have to give another chance just because like, maybe it's less wretched now that I'm a little less emotionally, emotionally invested in whether or not this is going to be a living franchise. It's been dead for a while now. You know, like, yeah, you know I, I had a glimmer of hope whenever Genesis came out. I was like, oh, this is this is a different direction. This is something new. This has got like a new fresh star. It's got Christian Bale in it. I'm not really sold on him as John Connor, but I like I like a lot of what they did here. Yeah, um, I couldn't. That's that's where it went off the rails for me. That was the that was like the uh, like the third one went off the rails, too. But when they start when the Christian Bale one came out. That's when I was just like, oh, I don't, I, I just knew, I was like, okay, now I know I don't want to see the future of the Terminator. I, that's like not the part of the movie. That we don't well, want John Connor I was in these movies. massively well, disappointed yeah. in the future, yeah. Yeah, I got to say, just going through what we're still talking about initial reactions to, one thing that hurt this movie initially, too, is the title. It's like you don't call your movie Terminator 2 Judgment Day and have it not be about Judgment Day. It's like that was that was a promise the movie utterly failed to deliver. It's like, you're like, oh, it's wow. Utter, it, this doesn't, movie. it doesn't utterly fail. Well, you kind of get your cake and eat it, too. Because okay. you get well, that beautiful it, get the, artistic yeah. sequence where Sarah has the nightmare and Judgment Day happens. Also, like yeah. we really get to see it in the movie. It's on screen. Yeah, and I, the, I, I've the seen thre- of the movie. I've seen, I've seen threads by this point. I'd seen Nuclear War depicted with far more horror than this. I mean, this was this was threads light. Yeah, but but maybe <laughs> I think you could say I, I, maybe this is stretching it, but maybe you could say that Judgment Day is Sarah Connor judging. Skynet and deciding to not allow it to happen. Like that might be. Oh yeah. This, well, there's the lots of. Well, Judgment Day, you could you could justify the title in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah that but that great. seems like it might have yeah, actually that's, been that's, an intentional. No, I, I think that is deliberate, but it's also if you're expecting Judgment yeah, yeah. Day, because I, I I thought the same thing. I'm like, because yeah, the, the core of this movie is should Sarah take the safe path and let this go, you know, allow Judgment Day to happen allow humanity to get decimated but know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel or take the risk and change history and maybe fuck everything up and have john connor get killed and have it have humanity get wiped out it's a, you wanted uh, cyborg you, you, you wanted the john claude van damme movie cyborg when you went into this that's what you were looking for when you saw the title judgment day right like that's that's what it uh, seems to seen indicate. cyborg so i can't answer the question but yeah i mean well i you know i mean it, it, it's just that's part of it. I mean, there there are, there's other issues, but uh, well, it, I, if they like, cast an older John Connor and this movie was about the world ending and the rise of the machines, that would have really set up the rest of the franchise a lot better. Um, and it would have been really rad to see that. I will admit that. So and and I will this. say, despite my misgivings about the movie and my critiques, one of my notes is it's still always fun when I watch it. Like I still like yeah. I I went back and rewatched it. I think five years ago and before that, like, I don't know, the early 2000s, I, I made a point of rewatching it. And every time I'm entertained by it and I kind of go in with the same thing where it's like I go in remembering how much I hate how this destroyed T1. And then <laughs> and then and then it kind of wins me over by the end, even though it still doesn't rise up in my mind to T1. I think it's, you know, it's it an entertaining it movie. It's well made. And it, it it does some interesting things where you're like, oh, now I see how it's commenting on this part of the old movie or this. You yeah. know, th- there's a lot of very interesting things like that. Um, you know, hopefully yeah. I'll be able to find my notes on that stuff because I did. 
<laughs> I notice things, yeah. but I have this pile of notes, and I don't know if I'll be able to work my way through them. Um, I remember the very first time when she goes to kill the uh, guy who's going to create Skynet. It's like that scene that the first time I watched, I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. But, you know, for a while, the movie kind of keeps that momentum, but I feel it, it kind of got lost somewhere. But uh, Well, yeah, it, after that scene, a lot of the heart of the movie is gone. Yeah, like we, we, there's some yeah. really cool stuff that happens after that. The raid on uh, the raid on the, the the corporate headquarters and the the shootout with the cops is thrilling. That's great. Um, yeah. Get out is one of the best lines in the movie delivered. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and everything um, after that is downhill, though. Once they leave, yeah. South, I feel I felt the whole truck chase. I felt I agree. Back. I felt like the you, truck chase. I, I remember the first time I was watching, on. I was like, aren't we just repeating the end of the last movie at this I, point? Can this hurry up and be over with? Because you've got nothing here to say anymore. But I think so you that, hit on, on the strength of the movie, Adam, which is um, this is one of the best transitions of a lead character from part one to part two, where they have mm -hmm. like an arc for the character, where it actually, yep. where, where it's not just like, oh, they've planned out this arc because it's awesome. It actually makes sense. Yeah. And it's jarring because like she becomes a, like, like now we take this story and it's been in other movies too. We take the story. And it's like, okay, the character becomes a badass. This, this, you yeah. know, and that's the thing. <laughs> but what this movie does is she becomes a badass, but she's a deeply troubled badass because yes. of all the stuff she's been through. And that's the difference that makes this one, th flawed, this version of that type of badass. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, I feel, I feel to, to get into one of my big issues I, what, what I, I had the other night when I got to the end of the movie is the ending feels weird. It's like mm -hmm. when you get to the end of Terminator 1, that final scene of her driving off into the desert with the storm and everything oh, in the flawless, horizon. Man. Absolutely flawless. It, my jaw just dropped the yeah. first time I watched that. And this is like, you got the little thing, well, you know, the future's undefined, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, here's the thing. It's like, okay, assuming... You know, cause watch it, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm pretending there are no more Terminator movies. It's like, yeah, okay, if they killed Skynet, if they stopped it from happening, that means Kyle Reese never was born because he was born after the war. That means Kyle Reese never came back in time. The previous Terminator never came back yeah. in time. Yep. John Connors was never conceived. So the, they, they really missed the boat because the dramatic choice she's making isn't just should I try and avert this nuclear war or should I let things play out the way I know they're going to play out? It's should I let should I let this nuclear war happen and let my son live or should I save humanity from this nuclear war and erase my son? That that if you're actually playing so, by time travel rules, that that would have been a hell of an ending. Well, <laughs> well that leads me to a question I had that I want to and maybe you kind of answered it. But let me ask the question and see, um, does the processor and arm from T1 being the thing that caused T1 to even happen in the first place, does that make the same kind of loop sense as the Kyle Reese being John Connor's father in the first movie made? Do you know what I mean? Is that? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's the bootstrap paradox is the term mm -hmm. for that or, yeah. or a causal loop, you could also call but it. But does that yeah, feel, but, that's, is, but, but my point is, does that feel as perfectly sealed as the John Connor example, or does that one feel to you like it's got any issues that aren't present or... Because I think that that's that's something I was trying to judge the movie on, where I was like, well, the first movie had this perfect loop that was structured around John Connor's parentage. And this one kind of cre tries to create a perfect loop around the, the the first Terminator parts leading to all of the events that happen. And so, you know, I couldn't really find a flaw with it, but I was just curious if anybody well, else found a, a flaw. Yeah, see, that's it. the thing. If you if you can break the bootstrap strap paradox of the Terminator's arm. If you can break that, that's like I'm saying, by default, it should break the other mm. bootstrap paradox, mm. which which is the one that gives us John Connors being born. So, yeah, and, you know, and, and once again, Sarah Connors becoming a badass. Okay. Like, so, none, of that, none of that should have happened to her okay. if she actually changed. So you, so you did. So in isolation, they're each fine, but it's when you put them together that you have this problem because the... the you can't break the one arm. without breaking yeah. the other. It's so, uh, well, yeah, or, it's got, or the humans are just or the humans and Skynet are wrong. It seems like there's a time there has to be a timeline, even in the first movie, where there's no time travel paradox. But for some reason, a Terminator okay. gets sent back in time to kill someone. 
why? Well, what theory of time travel are they using in the Terminator movies? Well, because that is, they don't clarify. The it. original one made sense because it was a closed loop. It's like this but was what time though. always. Oh, okay, but think about it. Was... Why would Skynet send back a Terminator to kill nobody? John Connor doesn't exist in the original timeline where Skynet does, and there's no John Connor. Ah. No, but now if, if you're assuming there's only one unchangeable timeline, there are no changes to time in the original. Well, I, movie. I think that's like, what it's trying it to tell us. Always that way. What? I, I think. I think that's what it's trying to tell us. Skynet's inevitable, and so's John Connor. Yeah. Like there, there is no future period See, except the one that's going to happen, no matter yeah. what you do with time travel. And that, so it's that would all have irrelevant. Been, that would have been a better ending for me, is if you kind of had all the same events, but they realized conclusively that you, you know, no matter what you do, time is going to. You know, somehow, because I mean, obviously, they did have Skynet happen in the sequels anyway. Well, but if, I felt if like the third movie it, was. It, it, you could make this make sense if the third movie was Skynet happens anyway, because in the original yeah. timeline with no John Connor, Skynet happened. It's happened later, but John knows everything about it, and he knows the technology that it's going to turn into that gives him the advantage to beat it, and he knows yeah. how to make the time loop that gets them to the point where they're victorious one way or the next. You could have yeah. had a perfectly closed loop. With yeah. the third movie, but they were idiots and they, they didn't know how to write that. Yeah. So, well, I think the third movie was very thrown together in a lot of ways. But well, um, yeah, it was. It should have been a sci-fi. It should have been a sci-fi movie. It should have went. It should have went horror and then action and sci-fi. But it went horror then action then comedy. Whoa. Yeah. Well, it, it well that's another thing I want to talk about. It should have been resolved in the second movie though by not resolved. That's why the the, the ending feels unsatisfying to me because it's like, well, you're not answering the question. I mean, <laughs> ambiguous endings can be good. There are things I like that yeah. have ambiguous endings. This felt like an ambiguous ending where I just feel like I, it doesn't feel I, I don't know. It, it feels unresolved, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and I, that that's something you can't really rinse out of your mouth. It does feel unresolved. Yeah. This is the fact. yeah. You know, I, I have a note here that says um, the Terminator may not know what love is, but he is definitely programmed with a sense of humor. And oh, so I think, <laughs> well, huh? Because he smirks at one point. Well, he smirks he, and he's he's, yeah. he's dropping because this is like he, this is after Arnold's been established as the one liner guy. And so, yeah, you know, the one liners in Terminator were like unintentionally funny or funny because yeah. it's so dead serious. You know, what I mean? but but these are more like commando one liners that he's dropping here, even it's if he's doing show. it in the deadpan yeah. Terminator style. Well, remember um, that this this T101 was programmed by the same kid who taught him to say hasta la vista, baby. And knew he did that. <laughs> yeah, you got a point. It's like, John Connor. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put in some humor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah fair enough. Fair enough. But I like that. But my point, my broader point, is more about the movie itself, um, which is the tonal shift of again the rock music, like the scene where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes down with a leather jacket and it's playing "Bad to the Bone." That you was know, yeah. that, that, like a comedy beat. When I was yeah, yeah, that song. would not work in T1. The thing right? is, like there was. Yeah, for people that weren't around when this movie came out, Bad to the Bone was a freaking cliche in movies. But yeah. like Chris, Christine, which came out in the 80s, when they're like the Stephen King story, when they made that a movie in the early 80s, the Carpenter movie, the whole opening montage of Christine being billed as the Bad to the Bone. And it was it's, just it, every, it, it, was, it was just like, ah. Uh, it's the music <laughs> they would have used in Married with Children if Al was put on a motorcycle for some reason. Yes. Right? Like it's the most stereotypical a choice. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's now it's now long enough that it didn't really bother me the other night. Mm -hmm. But in 1991, that was so cheesy. So it, it almost it felt like a comedy beat. Yeah, it was. Like, it was definitely it, a comedy beat. It was intentionally yeah. done to be funny. There's like no doubt in my mind. And yeah. there's a lot of stuff like that throughout <laughs> the movie where he's just con like. You know, I can't remember the lines, but like when he's asking him not to kill people and he's like, why? And then like, he, you know, this, the scene where, you know, he's like, he, he's just the way the Terminator is explaining things in a very literal way is it's not the kind of humor that was in the first movie. It's a different kind of humor. And another thing I was thinking about is that opening sequence. They both start with the same opening music in the first movie. That music has a certain atmosphere it creates, right? that is mm -hmm. sustained through the whole movie. And when I started watching this one this time around, I was paying attention to that. And I was like, you know, it's the same music being played, but I know because I've seen the movie before, it's not going to feel like this music at all throughout. Yeah. You know, I'm not, you're not going to end because the, the end of the last movie 
what you think about when that music plays is the death of Kyle Reese, right? It's almost like a it's almost like a yeah. flat line that music in a weird way. And and in this movie, I think bad to the bone. And I think you know, <laughs> like uh, you know, the this the 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 security guard with the coffee played by the twins and you know, just th- those kinds of things. Um yeah. but I love that guy, by the way. Oh, he was so those, cool. those I was thinking about <laughs> this like say. That those those two actors, they're twins, right? The guys that played those security guards, they must have to stay at perfectly the same weight in order to continue getting work. <laughs> like that's gonna be incredibly frustrating. If one of them gains five pounds, the other's gotta get if one of them loses, they gotta it's it's they, they, they just match their menus every day. They're like, how <laughs> many calories are you up to? Oh. <laughs> so because that guy's also at like an unusual weight where it's not like an, that does not seem like an easy weight to stay at the weight that he yeah. was at in the movie. It's not <laughs> yeah, he's particularly like large, it's not particularly overweight. small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, plump. he's pleasantly plump. Yeah, he's plump or portly. He's like not quite, he's, he's kind of fat. on a borderline. He's like a borderline yeah. physique. And so um, <laughs> I was just thinking about that. <laughs> he's, he's rocking the Joel physique there. He's looking pretty good is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> we can confirm that. Um, <laughs> Shut so, up. <laughs> Only I, was, I, can... <laughs> I was supporting what you said. Why do you want me to shut up? <laughs> Only I can take the piss out of me. Okay. <laughs> I was, but that's you said not to the two the people that supporting. constantly take the piss out of them. So the other oh, thing I was God. thinking about is there's a scene. I never really noticed this before, but you know, Dr. Silverman, he's kind of like the through line for mm-hmm. movie one, two, and three, because yeah. he even appears in part I can't, three. I, I cannot think of him another way ever since you introduced me to that idea that yeah. he's like this through line between the movies. You're it, right. It really yeah. changes. It changes the whole experience. <laughs> but, but he's uh, the C-3PO. He is actually he, the point yeah. of view character. He needs his own book, this guy. He definitely needs <laughs> his own book. Because in this movie, he gets like, what, stabbed in the arm or shot in the arm. And he gets shot in the arm. And it looks like he might even be having like a mild heart attack or something so, at some point. He's um, fine. But well, yeah, we find out in the next movie he's fine. But he said he mentions to Sarah how she believes her son's father is uh, is from the future, um, you know, and like it's part of her delusion. But he evaluated her her son's father because he was there at the police station when Sarah was being protected there. So it just leads me to wonder. And again, I haven't seen part three in a little while. And maybe if I saw part three recently, there's clarifying dialogue. But just based on this movie alone, uh, you know, there's an implication that people knew things and concealed it because the uh, the, the the microprocessor was found in the arm. Mm-hmm. So is he part of the cover up or is he? I think that's just the really skeptical. Honestly. Well, uh, and that and he's clearly made a career out of Sarah. Yeah. yeah, like he he makes empty promises to her. He's bringing his students to to check out the case. He yeah. definitely knows more than he tells other people. He leverages that knowledge to his own advantage. He's a pretty wormy character, you know. So mm-hmm. it kind of it's in character for him to get paid off by what, what was the Megadyne? I can't remember the name. It's some Cyberdyne. Oh. Cyberdyne. There we go. Cyberdyne Systems. Um, I just couldn't couldn't recall from memory. It, it it's in character for him to get paid off by Cyberdyne. I could see that. Yeah, totally. And it, and it might be clarified in part three, because I do remember there's a scene in the cemetery with him kind of giving exposition to people. Um, but I just can't remember what the details are, because it's again, it's not the greatest movie in the world. So perfectly entertaining, but not as memorable as these two. I'm going to have um, to watch it again. You've, you've convinced me I'm about to lose 90 minutes of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh yeah, as far as the final part of the movie went, too, it just, I felt like so much of it was time-wasting in the final action sequence. Like, you have the whole thing with the truck following him, and it's, ooh, the truck's full of dry ice. You're like, you can see it is. They keep letting you see that it's full of liquid nitrogen. And it's like, you're, ooh, it's going to freeze him. that waiting for that truck to crash. And then he does get frozen, and it's a cool special effect. But then he just comes back together and it didn't change anything plot wise at all. Yeah. It's like, Oh, now there's still be, and you know, and it's just like, well, well, I guess you wanted to, you know, show off your cool morph effects, which were very, that's the problem the with time, it. but it, it did nothing. And we spent like 10 minutes on, on that whole sequence. It, it, it gets like, oh. set up forever. And then it, the payoff is really nice for like three seconds. 
Con- contrast that to the first movie where the truck blows up and then he's on fi- it's on fire and he walks out of the fire as the the skeletal version of the Terminator, which was mind blowing. It's like the effects are a hundred times yeah. cheesier and cheaper, but man, that that blew me away. I was like, the movie's over. Oh no, it's not. Whereas this time it was just like you're doing the same trick, but it's it just doesn't work. Yeah, I, I it also it it calls into question whether the way that they do kill him would even work because if liquid nitrogen yeah. <laughs> and then shattering him doesn't destroy him, why should I assume that liquid metal being melted down? I mean, he's liquid metal. Why would that? Yeah. You know? then, they, then they did the flip thing where the T one thousand you know drives that pole through Arnie and his light yeah. his eyes goes out and everything and it's like oh yeah he killed him and it's like suddenly <gasps> secondary energy source yeah. turning on five minutes later it's like uh it just it just felt like yeah. twice twice in a row you had these terminators pull these magical abilities out of the air just so they could die and come back and it's like I, uh. I have I don't know what the truth is but I feel like Cameron probably wanted it written so that she actually dispatched the T1 at the end yes and Arnold yes. kind of wanted to get some I, amount of the glory at the end and so that I was heading well, the same because there, there's got to be a version of this where Arnold gets destroyed in that fight and then yep. he he gets frozen somehow and then she shoots him and that's how she kills him you know, or, or maybe just that she, just, or she knocks harder. him into the thing yeah, herself. It when they're should fighting have been him. Sarah. Yeah. It should have yeah. been Sarah. Having it be the Terminator was not the right way to go. Because it also works because it gives Arnold still has the moment where he shatters the guy, but then he dies. And then you have her, you know, knocking, you know, and I guess you don't get the emotional send off. You know, you know, now I know why doves cry or whatever it is he says. <laughs> now I know why doves cry. That's like a million times better life. Yeah. But, that is the most mocked part of the movie. So yeah, yeah. if uh, well, it's the what does he say? He says it in a really way I weird know way. Now why you cry. Yeah, I know now. It, it's like it's it's like uh kind of archaic the way he says it, rather than robotic, so it just doesn't make sense to me. Like um, whenever uh Fry started doing uh, ye when he thought he was a robot. Robots don't say ye. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly like, come on, Arnie. Robots don't say I know now. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, also, I just got to say, I did not like John Connor in this movie at all. Like, I really no likes John detested him. Um, I, nothing against the actor. I just think that the. No, the, I think the performance was, I was actually thinking his performance was actually pretty good. I yeah. I think, and there were it, really it, good it, moments in it. I agree with you. The problem is that he didn't act like a real juvenile delinquent kid. Yeah. It's like the, the well, things okay. they, it's like, but the performance, I was actually like, even when he was kind of being annoying in parts, I'm like, this feels like an annoying 12 year old. Like, for example, did they even, did they show him smoking a cigarette at all? Was he smoking no, a cigarette? Oh, no. God, no. So, because I mean, that would have been that, like, back in 1991, I can definitely confirm this. The dividing line between yes. a juvenile delinquent and non was if you smoked or not. Those were the I bad smoked kids in smoked. So yeah. that, that proves the point. Yeah. Um, go. And, you know, so, so, but Joel, you were going to say something. So I don't okay. Know. Okay. So he's not a real delinquent. He's rebellious. But what he really is is the future savior of humanity. And you know this mm-hmm. because the friends he makes are undyingly loyal to him. Yeah. He's able to beat computers casually, which is what yep. he does. He's always trying to save his mom or do the right thing or prevent his mom from killing someone. He's a he's actually John Connor. He's the this is just the shitty teenage face of John Connor. But John Connor can still have a past that involves smoking. Do you know what I mean? Like he could he could Oh yeah. You know, he looks yeah. like a guy in the future he looks like yeah. a guy that's smart. Yeah, cuz and, and, and <laughs> I, the one thing I will say about Christian Bale is he does match that guy pretty well in terms of the type, yeah. you know, trying to cast somebody who looks like the guy that they used. But uh but yeah, that guy looks like he smoked cigars every day or something. You know what I mean? Or, so <laughs> he's had uh, a hard life. I would yeah, really have loved war, if they <laughs> it would have been really nice to see John a little older. Um, I, I don't think the smoking is necessary, but it would have been nice to see him a little older, and I would have liked to have seen him get his fucking scar in this movie. That yeah. would have been rad. Like, that, imagine him battling right. the fucking T-1000. Mm-hmm. His face gets scarred. Considering yeah. they gave the T-1000 blade arms that he would attack people it with, they had the setup right there. Yeah. 
<laughs> it, that is a little odd. Maybe they just didn't want it to be so convenient that it was from. Yeah, or maybe someone. Okay, that is, that is a little. Having having the attack of the clones cut like that is too violent. It'll it'll affect our rating or something. I don't. Well, know. It's probably like the cigarettes. But again, back then they didn't care about putting cigarettes in a movie, so I don't know why they didn't do we that. Were, we were kind of on the borderline. Were we? Point, I think I don't know. That's. I, it's hard. It's it's hard to say, but uh, I mean, there was that. What was that movie? Like a hundred cigarettes, or remember there was a movie about smoking in the nineties. Yeah, I remember that, that one. Out. Yeah, yeah. Thanks yeah for I mean, it's uh, it's. But I mean, the thing of being a blockbuster movie is the difference. A hundred mm. cigarettes was not a summer blockbuster. Well, and that's. I think that's what damages the movie for me. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with being a blockbuster, but the Terminator, the first Terminator, it doesn't have the. No, that's not the structure of a movie. blockbuster. The, the first at all. movie has a has like street credentials. Like yeah. it's it's an OG film. This one isn't. It's not like it's bad. It's just like no, movie stars just, aren't bad. There's but just this like extra movie stuff star, thrown like, in there. There's like extra stuff to kind of pad it out for the. It's flat. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of fire that shouldn't. There's a lot of. Oh, the explosions a, are so yeah. stupid. There's just, they're cool, there's just a lot but of extra. Dumb. It could have been a very, I think it would have been a much better 90 minute movie, to be honest. Maybe a two hour movie. Um, yeah, I could have, like I said, that last scene, that, that whole last sequence, if you if you cut that down to like 10 or 15 minutes, it's like the movie would be significantly better no. to cut a lot of the fat okay, out. So of- I, I do want to voice an opinion, a, a dissenting opinion about the last sequence, because sure. it, it is long yeah. and it does drag on, but it's also pretty brutal. Like the characters mm-hmm. are all exhausted, yeah, that's and true. sweaty, and wounded, yeah. and their fights are protracted, miserable, grueling, gritty affairs. And it really it, it's a good feel for that. Yeah. And as a kid, I really liked how much tension and how much brutality was in it. So this, I think there's some redeeming elements to it. The scenes with Sarah oh, in the yeah. final battle are very good. The scene where she's going like that with the shotgun. Oh, that's that right. would have made a brilliant final scene. And I think one of my disappointments with it is that they do that and then they have this Shit. whole thing where Arnold you know what comes been the in. the perfect final scene? John, Con- she fucks, she fucks up and runs out of ammo. John Connor tackles him into the liquid metal and dies. Kills that the. Been interesting. Thousand. That would have, that would have been, been a curveball. That, right. That would have he goes in and he's got the robot arm too. and he's got the thing in his hand. Yeah. So yeah. he destroys Skynet and saves humanity, fulfilling his that, destiny. That, that could would certainly. Have, that would have resolved my whole thing about the time loop. I, yeah, I was that, complaining about that. Actually, would have been a fucking great. You know, it would have been better than doing I, the it, Back to the Future thing of having t- John Connor fade away because he th- no longer exists. Probably no way they could have done that in a blockbuster movie, but no, I do think it would have been a better oh, movie. They, yeah. they would never have. Done Wouldn't that, that have been that. so much better? So well, you know it. what? They could have done it if they if they had made it like he was a little bit older, like he was like, you know, in his early 20s or, you know, 18 well, or whatever. They had, of course, was they had to make in the age he was since the previous movie or whatever. Yeah, I, 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 I assume I assume he was the right age. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they got the timeline. To, yeah. OK, yeah. Probably I was, I was saying, you know, it's that it's it's like set in the time the movie came out. Yeah. So they, they kind of stuck with the young John. But Connor. but also they they couldn't have done it later because. Judgment Day is 1997, so by the time he's like That's 18. The original movie, I feel like in the original movie they said a different date, but I could be wrong. I was it 1997 that Skynet? I, I, I don't they... know. I, I that was something I, I meant to look up. I was like, I, when I when it came up as 97, I was like, I feel like it was a sooner date in the first movie. But I'll look it up. You you keep talking. And well, how, okay. how old would John Connor have been a year before Judgment Day? That would have been a way more. It would have been like 14, maybe. Yeah, I think maybe not even is, that. He was 10 in this movie. 10. Yeah. Like, give him four more years. Let him grow well, up a little bit. This movie has, this, done it. It has the same problem the prequels had, which is you take an adult, not an adult movie, like obviously Star Wars isn't just for adults, but The Terminator yeah. was. And you right. take a franchise that's got largely an adult audience, and then the sequel you you make with a lead character who's 10 years old, it's not going to land as well with, the crowd that came in to see Arnold Schwarzenegger mowing down people in Los <laughs> Angeles to, you know, to stop to stop a future uh, John Connor from annihilating the robots. So I, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> All right, I, I found about... a whole article on this. It's like in the, oh yeah, it's, it was you was ni- it's been ninety five uh, in the in the original. It's ninety five in the video game. It's ninety seven. Uh, Oh, Maybe wait, no, that's an it, indication, there's though. 2000, it becomes 2003 in Rise of the Machines. 
It becomes, so you know what I'll bet? I'll, I'll bet you what that means is they're trying to indicate to the audience that the events of the first movie altered the future somehow. Maybe. I think it's more just they're trying to keep pushing it into the future. Like, it becomes too soon. They're like, oh, it's too soon. Well, we got to... If it was anyone but James Cameron, I would say that James Cameron is a pretty detail oriented guy. And, and it's not like yeah. a and, and it's not like a real obscure detail. That's like a big detail that, you know, you you don't just drop without reflection. So, yeah, um, you know, it's not like sometimes people look for mistakes in the background. Like when we were watching The Shining, there's the whole thing with the dummy, not the dummy, the um, the, the the seven dwarf. Dopey, the dopey picture in the background, right? And people are like, this has meaning because in one shot it's here and in one shot it's there. But the date that Judgment Day is supposed to happen, I think, um, you know, that's pretty substantial. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. But uh, it's always August 29th. That is it is? August. Okay. Well, that's creepy. That's actually <laughs> eerie. Damn. You got me, James. You got me again. Oh, I want to say one thing this movie does really well is it explains, you know how John Connor had that really stiff marriage, uh, not marriage, a letter to his mother um, where he says like, thank you, Sarah, for all, you know, blah, 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 that Reese recites. And it doesn't sound like how a son would talk to their mother if they're sending a message back through time. I think that this movie kind of explains why John is so formal with his mother because yeah. they have such you know what I mean? like you well, can just that, see yeah, how they're when what they just it? escaped the uh they just escaped the insane asylum and he's in the back of the car he's so relieved and happy to see his mother and he's just like yeah. gushing with love and she's like you made a tactical error yeah and he's yeah, just, there, the he's just like me... trying to keep it together and he's still crying because he's 10 yeah. and it's hard to process like that was the perfect thing that explains that letter yeah you know? yep. yeah no, that like I said, the the mother son relationship in this was really good. I thought I thought that that every scene with that that was one of the things that made me have a better impression of John Connor in this movie. I was like, those scenes were good. Yeah. The scenes where he's hanging out with the other too. kid, that's really that's really the well, low point. Of the John and I think Connor. part of it was I like that, that kid though. That that I, other, I, I like don't like. Other, I dislike yeah. that kid very strongly because I think he was what? in big right and he was in um he was in like salute your shorts or something like that kid's got weird notoriety he was i think but he like, was also I, I, wasn't he in rocky five wasn't he the bully in rocky five he looks like the bully in rocky five but, but like okay but it just look, that, that kid, kid rubs me the narc. wrong way it's just i just but don't he like he didn't narc he, I, he, yeah Pop I, comes I, to him and he's like, I've not seen John Connor. Goes up to John. John, get out of here. Goes back to the cop. Hey, yeah. he went the other yeah, way. Yeah, I like that it's part. I didn't like that. Totally, that was what That's won the kind of leadership like, yeah, we like need them. in the future, man. Yeah. The yeah. Kid's so, the wait, is that kid supposed power. to be somebody important in the uh, resistance? No. No, absolutely not. But that's the kind of people that he finds in the resistance. Yeah. That's <laughs> exactly. who he inspires. Okay. He, like, knows, he's he, already knows, able. he knows how to recruit his friends. That kid saved John's life from an assassin droid like at yep. 10 years old john can recruit for that that's some yep. talent acquisition skill right there okay so yeah. here's a question i have and we'll take it separately for each of the terminators maybe but is the t-800 sapient in this movie or not like does it have self-awareness yeah self-awareness and like the little yes. extra oomph that makes it like 100 percent a human yeah, 100%. Person. Okay. um yeah. in the first one it doesn't or okay. it has the kind of machine well, intelligence manifest. that well, it, it has the same kind of machine self-awareness that makes it very not human mm -hmm. that Skynet has. You know, it, it's got that I have no mouth, but I'm a scream, uh, am kind of I'm aware, but I'm a monster stuff. Mm -hmm. Here, it learns what it means to be human. It does. It's schmaltzy yeah. and it, it results in the stupidest line in the movie. But it is well delivered by a skilled actor, even though he's a big, dumb, you know, yeah whatever he is greatest actor of our age i would say um, he, I, well certainly the heaviest but <laughs> it's a real well, that's another real interesting thing and this one did you notice the difference i mean it's only like what five six years between this and terminator but the, his physique is very different in this movie versus what it was like yeah. in the first terminator yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. well i mean like because he was primarily like a bodybuilder he was yeah. mr universe in the first one but he's primarily an actor in this one yeah. so like it's hard to get built to like your genetic limit of size growth, yeah. you know, 
um, it's it's a twenty four hour gig. So yeah. and he's I, still I massive. He was still very big. Oh, yeah. It's just it's well, just like a noticeable difference. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Big time. Uh, but I mean, I, I'm a I'm a. It's it's fine. It's fine. He's big enough. What about the T one thousand? Was that sapient? So I'm gonna call it the same kind of sapient that. Well, here's a weird thing. There's one point where the the T101 says he has the same files as me. Like it, like one for one the same. So maybe Like okay. I that that was a line that kind of stuck out to me. I'm like, "Wait, yeah, so you're right. Knows you're right. what you, you exact know exactly." Personnel. He's also yeah. very capable of extremely human-like deception when he's interacting with people. Do you know they what I mean? Traders. I mean, yeah. but I mean, then again, chat GPT is really good at that too. And it's not. Yeah. So but, but you know, the scene where like they ask him about the other, they say, Oh, some other guy was here and it's kind of a meta line. He's like, Oh, I wouldn't worry about him, you know, but, <laughs> it, but yeah. the way that he is deceptive with them just well, seemed. Why would he bother to say that? There's a lot of things like that about the T-1000 that kind of, I don't know. They they arched my eyebrow this viewing. I was like, wait, why did he say that? A machine wouldn't even bother to. He has a mission. Mm -hmm. He should be seeking it like a bullet, like the the original uh, Terminator did. But he doesn't. Well, when he also, says that really iconic line, "Get out." He spares that guy's life. Mm -hmm. Why does he well, do think, that to that helicopter pilot? I think um, I think in his case, he's he's not. You know, it's just more about the mission. Like if, if it's probably, he probably, I'll bet you, like what I was thinking, cause I was wondering about that. Sometimes he doesn't kill people. Sometimes he does. And I was thinking, oh, they must've prioritized it. So if it's going to be greater risk added to kill somebody, you don't kill them. If I, so you, you know I, I, mean? I just had the more cynical explanation that it was a good laugh line in the movie to have the yeah. guy jump out of the helicopter. That's probably, probably, that's probably <laughs> the more possible, But if, if we're taking this seriously, if we're saying like, is there yeah. evidence within the movie itself that the T-1000 has, like, either the same level of, like, sentience or potential for sentience that the T-101 does, like, is there? And I think there is, which is kind of a troubling notion. It means it actively chose to be an asshole. Yeah, well, the thing is, it's not a kindness to say get out. Cause it, is he saving his life? Does the guy survive the fall? Like, I mean, isn't he even cruel yeah, to go know. jump to your doom instead of just you know, putting a blade mm -hmm. through his head and killing him. It's like, that's a, <laughs> it, it was a, it, it's an even more messed up thing than straight out killing him. In a that's lot true. Of ways. Um, so to which that goes back to the sapiens thing. Does he enjoy causing this guy emotional pain? Well, Is, he does torture Sarah after that by sticking the thing in her arm. I mean, that's, that's a tactical. That's to get information that's though. Yeah. Well, and he even says, I know this hurts, to, which to, to me, it's part. like, that's not how a normal, like a person doesn't say, I know this hurts. It's, it's, it's a mm -hmm. weird thing to say, you know well, what I mean? A person wouldn't, but a sadist might, especially a machine that's becoming sadistic, like mm -hmm. actively becoming like a sociopathic serial killer. But I don't think, I didn't get the impression he was enjoying it. I thought I got the impression that he was just like trying to persuade her that like he understood that, so that she understood that he understood where this was going. Do you know what I mean? So that she would then tell, she would call for John. Why um, communicate that you understand that it hurts them? Hmm. He, if he knows about it and she knows about it, why would he say it? Oh, because he's probably sensing that she's trying to hold back evidence of the pain that she's having. Yeah, but you know? why would he say that? He says it, the, the reason I would I mean, think fair enough, say it fair enough. is because he wants to communicate that he's enjoying that it hurts someone. Okay, I just didn't get he's pleasure gloating. on his face. I didn't see him being somebody who's enjoy. I just saw him. Somebody... This actor is is great at making a machine yeah. feel like Hannibal Lecter. Right. I, I really do like we're this talking about so here. He What's was that? really good in this. I, I have yeah. to say, absolutely I, set it on fire. Yeah, was it Robert Patrick? Was that his name? Robert yeah, Patrick? I just watched him in Peacemaker. He plays the the father in Peacemaker, and he was fantastic in that. So it was fun going back and watching him in this I, again. Watching this, I was desperately trying to create like a fan fiction that connected this character with his character from The Sopranos, and it just was not. <laughs> there was just no way that I could. You work the X Files in there. You got. I was thinking that too, but I thought that might be too. That might go too much into um, uh, what's That's his name? Too easy, it, almost. Well, no, the guy who uh, Pat, the Pat Oswald. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but yeah, I don't know. I, I thought it was a good. He's he's generally good. Um, but yeah, there was another thing. Oh, 
Uh, what about the orderly who's basically pulling the buck from Kill Bill? Um, I kind of forgot about that scene. And oh, I yeah, was like, he is pulling the buck. For, or maybe yeah. the buck from Kill Bill is a pulling of him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's, the, well, yeah, that's really more what it is. But I guess I, I have never enjoyed seeing someone get like 1970s style curb stomped anywhere near as much as this guy. <laughs> well, Sarah straight up hate crimes. I, I wondered dude. if yeah. that was what prompted uh, Tarantino to include that character in Kill Bill. Um, cause it, cause it's very similar. It's it's like no, obviously not the same. Like they're totally different movies, but it's definitely. I saw that. I was like, oh, that Tarantino probably saw this movie. You know, he's always uh, a fan of yeah. action movies. So, yeah, you know, not not um, shocking. Yeah, my note is: is this guy one of Buck's cousins? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, the I guy. That guy was really repulsive. Also, I I, I'm with Joel on that. The every like even even just everything about him was. Like, oh. He does a good job you know, of communicating to the audience that this place is not a place of healing. It yeah. is a, a it is a prison for Sarah. It, yeah. So well, it does two things. It communicates that. It also communicates her determination because she's hiding the key in her mouth, and so she's yeah. just you know she's not reacting because she has a task to do. Um, yeah. I like so, that her task he, involves beating the ever loving hell out of that guy, though. That was, that <laughs> well, was fine. You know, <laughs> and, and so, um, though, there's another scene uh, where there's two guys and they think that Arnold is like, you know, attacking John or something because he throws him on the ground and they come over to help. And then John, then John says, like, get bent or whatever. And then they, yeah, they call him a dip. Like, the guy gets so angry. It, it's like such a it's just a weird characterization because he's initially coming to save the kid from from yeah. what he thinks is a violent attacker. And then he instantly turns on the kid and it, it is like almost ready to come to blows. And it's a weird scene overall, because, I mean, I feel like the point of the scene is that, you know, it's it's John realizing you can't abuse the fact you have a terminator it can get out of hand very quickly yeah you know, so I, I feel like it would have been terminator. i feel like it would have been better if the guys were just good guys that came over to help and yeah. john was being smart ass brat and then realized whoa 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 okay this uh, yeah, yeah. I, or they were bad from the beginning you didn't need to have them come over to protect him and then do the 180 it's I, just I a weird... I, that wouldn't have worked as well i don't think because I, I i i think they needed to be coming over to be helpful to make it because i mean it's it's supposed to be about john fucking up i mean it's john mm, learning okay mess. yeah john's you know, the asshole in that so okay I, i'm fine with it yeah I, yeah his touchy, use of what does Rose. not make the scene any more endearing right or do you you know uh, what does he say? Like, did you call moi a dipshit? He's annoying yeah. when he's taught. He always throws in like lingo from other languages. And the way he does it is just like, it's just particularly annoying. I don't know why. Well, um, it is interesting that he is a polyglot. He but he's not. He's just languages. he's doing a Bart no, he Simpson. Does, he's he's, he's well, imitating he is, Miss but... Piggy is what he's doing. She was yeah. like in the 80s. If you think about yeah. someone who says moi all the time, it's it's Miss Piggy. It's like, yeah. Yeah, what, what, not, is, he, what is that? I don't, I don't expect that he's then going to go to a French bakery and order all of his food in French. I just, well, well, you know, he just thing, knows though. that one word. The, the, here's the thing, though. He does actually speak Spanish fluently because he grew up. Yeah, in that a lot. And there's like. I, I would be not surprised if he spoke French fluently, too, at least like French Canadian French, because like he led the entire North American continent in resistance against Skynet. Being a polyglot okay. would make sense. For so him. fair enough. Fair enough. Let's sit. Let's let's grant those two things. I will grant you those because because I do think he knows Spanish based on what we see in the movie. And definitely Sarah. Sarah has this connection to Mexico that they establish in the first movie. Mm -hmm. as well. Oh, yeah. Spanish but, speaking made yeah. total sense. Yeah. But if he can speak those languages, have him pick better words than moi and hasta la vista. Baby. I you refuse. Know, like, yeah. Those are the yeah. most 90s words to possibly pick. They're the most 90s because of this movie, though. That's like. Yeah, the, I was going to yeah. say hasta la vista came from. I mean, I knew I took Spanish, so I yeah. knew. It. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't a, you know, there was no cool. It was just see you later in Spanish. Look, but but, but to he me, had just it's... watched Encino Man, and he wanted to be as cool as Encino Man. That was later, wasn't it? Shut up. Probably, it probably was. But it, it, remi <laughs> it, it remind. Up. It's very much like the I Caramba of Bart Simpson. You know, ah, is that kind yeah. of? Yeah. Know, it, they really went to Bart Simpson with yeah. them. That's a that's a completely legitimate complaint that needs to be vented. What was the what was the what was it on the Simpsons when they had the cool character who showed up for an episode and then they had Poochie. to get rid of him? Poochie. It's 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 almost Poochie level 
Uh, <laughs> it is very Poochie. Yeah. When Poochie's not on screen, everybody should be asking, where's Poochie at? Poochie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I don't know. Is there anything else that we uh, we need to talk about here about this movie? Oh, is I a... I exhausted my notes. Oh, go ahead. Is a liquid metal Terminator feasible the same way that the original <laughs> Terminator model is feasible? Uh... Well, I, honestly, I would say even if it is feasible, it's probably so high maintenance. It's like all they could have done is hid for a month and it probably just would have uh, stopped working. Well, well, let me rephrase. <laughs> Does it like the first Terminator? I don't feel strains credulity. I feel like it's like within the realm of believability for a science fiction movie. Is yeah. this within the realm of believability for a science fiction movie? <sighs> It's it's a huge technological leap for sure. I mean, I guess if you're going, oh, it's the singularity now. We have AI and it's expanding at a crazy, insane rate. But mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, yeah, it, yeah. I feel like if they had a T1000, they should have sent that one back first. Because it like, well, they change they change the camera. yeah. That's a good the, point. the intro is oh, actually there were two Terminators sent back. Maybe they just had a T1000 and a T800, and they had to send. The better one back to kill John. Maybe that was the uh, uh, the angle. Well, I it's weird that Skynet was like, let's hedge our bets. Uh, you know, like yeah. the the very premise of this movie kind of makes it silly that they have a T one thousand at all. Yeah, you know? yeah, I would agree. Like, I would agree. I, I'd say it's strange credulity in terms of like, why was the first? Why did the first movie even happen? Like you have a T one thousand, let send it back, man. Like that's yeah. the one. That's your A game. Well, you said you send that further back too, so it has more time to do the job. You don't send, you know. It's like okay, well, we've got this. We've got this crappier Terminator. We and why not send them both at the same time too? Why not send both Terminators to nineteen eighty four and have them team up? Because nineteen eighty four didn't have abyss level technology, so that they could you know do the uh, the liquid metal. But <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I'm with with Adam on this one. There's probably something about the life expectancy of how long these robots can last. Or maybe right. there's some caustic effect of time travel that makes them slowly like, I don't know, fade from reality as they become less likely. I don't know. I, I think there's probably something to there's their limited time scale that made those times viable somewhere in the fiction of the movie, you know? How did a, I, how did a liquid metal thing go back when you can't send non-organic objects back to? Also, oh, it, was, why, it was inside, why, of a, he, inside of a guy. Why did he need to steal the policeman's uniform when later on he uh, can just kind of change his clothing? That's a good point. Change. That's a very good point. <laughs> That's the other thing. There are so many more practical applications of the T-1000 than sending him back to kill people that... It's almost a waste. Do you know what I mean? Because this he can literally replicate anything, right? So it's just it's 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 the ultimate well, utility it, it device. Replicate complicated machines that was established. And the irony of that is he is a complicated machine. I know. <laughs> the most conceivable. Like, people are the most complicated are, machine. Humans are complicated yeah. machines when it comes down to it. Yeah. But it uh, should have had it be something really sentimental, like he can't replicate a human heart. You know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I, I don't think. I don't know how complicated of a machine he is exactly in terms of like, like well, macro scale moving parts. I don't think he has organs. I think he's just solid silver junk. Yeah. Inside. But that's even more. Outside looks like stuff. That's, so I understand at least I can imagine how a T-800 operates. Like I can sort of compare it to a computer. I have analogs in my head. I can't imagine anything that would cause this thing to work. And that's where I sometimes have, that's like the gap for me whenever I watch this movie. Well, I, um, part of that is kind of appealing for me because, like, I don't I, I'm like, I'm with you. I don't get how this would work. But that sort of seems like some way a, a super machine might attack a human being with something that doesn't make any sense to us. Because like we but, think about ourselves in terms of here's my brain. Here's my heart. These are the systems that make me work. It's one unit of thing like there's no weak point. There's no shoot it in the in the brain chip mm -hmm. like there is with the T-800. It really is an advancement strategically in what yeah. a Terminator can be. That's cool. I, I actually like that bit. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is like, um, it almost takes it into the realm of fantasy. Cause in the first movie, they explain how the T-800 works. Do you know what I mean? Like they don't tell you how to build one, but you, you understand the principles of what's involved. And this one, they just say it's liquid metal. They give a fancy name for it. 
but they tell you it's just liquid metal and they don't give you any explanation. There's no hint at how this technology was cracked. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah, at all. that's the part that I think I, don't, I would have liked. And maybe that would somehow weak. Like maybe if I saw it, I wouldn't. I'd be like, oh, no, that makes it even worse because now it's like hokey. OK, but, here's the thing. You could have. How hard would it have been to been like, OK, we were in the we were in the place. He sent back the Terminator. We sent back Kyle. And when we cracked into the actual, you know, the actual core of it, it was made of this stuff. That was the only stuff of, like that in the planet. It was this thing's brain and processor. And it found a way to send itself back in time. So we're like, well, oh, shit. So it is Skynet. Would have been great. That right? would have been a better <laughs> explanation. I still would like to know the theory well, of how this thing works. So, uh, you could I... say I, mimetic polyalloy is fine with me. You know, it's it's an impossible. See, but the problem with that is that is like what what's the reversing the polarity of the whatever it is in the um, in Doctor Who the the grand explanation they have for everything. It's it's sort of like that kind of explanation. It where... is, but I mean, like. Like you could say it's a metal that is so unbelievably difficult to make that mm -hmm. like all of it in the world is right here in this one little puddle that's like just one dude. And it's effectively indestructible and it works in ways that are hard to comprehend or explain. Like because sometimes that's just how physics works. There's just reams and reams of text you have to go through before you actually understand what this thing is doing. And it could just be that it's like, look, it's really hard to make and irreplaceable is the bullet point you give to an audience and i'm fine with that like i okay. this isn't but they should have given us that bullet point because mm -hmm. what's the limit on making this stuff why aren't there a million of these why isn't there an arm why the big robots why not just a million of these guys destroying the last remnants of humanity you know like is it what's what's his power source like certainly he kind of takes energy from something he's not violating thermodynamics well, but that's the other that's straight. the other problem with it it's like with the t800 you have a sense of what its strengths and weaknesses are and so it's kind of easier in the fight scenes to understand what's going on in this one yeah. it's whatever they want it to be and so that's that's why things like like i complain i mean that it, that's the issue too in the final scene it's terminator versus terminator and like i said the thing with the energy reserve on you know arnie and stuff it's just like we've got yeah, at least in the first movie, we didn't fully understand the Terminator's cap capacity, but at least we knew what the humans were capable of against this mysterious enemy. Whereas you get to this and it's that final scene, it's these two beings that keep manifesting abilities we don't know about. And I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be too picky here, but that, that yeah, oh, me, I am. But uh, that, that, well, that to <laughs> me is <laughs> if the movie uh, invites pickiness, though, I mean, like its yeah. premise has some holes in it. Like, yeah, yeah, the the alternate power source, I didn't even remember that when I was like, I remember him getting, I remember the light dying in his eyes and then he got back up. But I was like, why did he do that? Oh, he just can, I guess. Well, at least oh, they provided right. an explanation, I'll say. It's, at least that is like, okay, I can imagine I'm not, a, a, another he, battery in there. I feel like um, it's the kind of thing that would work better if they'd set up the alternate battery thing yeah. somehow earlier yeah, they, in the movie. It's like, oh, stuff, the but... alternate battery. <laughs> it's a bit, yeah, yeah. if he said, I'm a just, C800 with an alternate battery, yeah, like something. Would've. Yeah, well, it would have been really cool to have been like, yeah, I've been modified from the old model. I have an additional power source that isn't inside yeah. of my yeah. knowledge base. That would have been great. So no, the, hey, you, the could have said, you could have had that when he brought up the stuff about John Connor reprogramming him. Yeah, and that like would have been maybe. something the yeah. other Terminator didn't know about. It was like his secret we, trick. So the other right. Terminator truly believes he's killed him. But Connor's given him this that, that would make John Connor smarter. So it. uh yeah, yeah, it would have been John been. Connor's like, I know that the Terminator knows how to terminate other Terminators, but you're going to yes. have a couple of couple of tricks. And they could have actually given him more tricks. You know, I have the capacity to learn how humans feel and think, which the other one doesn't. That'll give me an intuition yeah. that gives me a, a, a ledge on him. That way in the scene with Miles Dyson, where he's trying to win those guys over, his actual ability to relate to humans could have been a tactical advantage given yeah. by John Connor. There were a lot of ways he could have tightened this up, you know. Um Again, this is we are coming at this from thirty. <laughs> if they if they were really the smart, the they would have just camped yeah, out at like 30. a smelting factory and just waited for the guy to show up so they could. They didn't know that him would beat him. <laughs> like they were yeah. like that's the thing that was really kind of frustrating, and it's always frustrating to me whenever like liquid Terminator esque stuff comes up. This happened in that new Superman movie that's now like five or ten years old or whatever, where like eventually he's just punching this like weird alien goop, and it's like, okay, how's a punch gonna help you, dude? 
How the bullets aren't working well, on the T one thousand? How do you need it? What's that's the thing. That's why I need some parameters explained about what this, how this thing operates, because yeah, you, you know, know it, it, well, it's it's the thing like with Marvel movies now. Every single character has a nano costume. You know, it's like once Iron Man had a nano suit that would just magically appear anytime, and every character in Marvel now has a nano helmet that appears and disappears, and it's like ah, the nano thing in Marvel. It's just like it's anything you want it to be there's just no stakes yeah. anymore yeah it, it removes the stakes and i i think it's scary that you don't have a plan for beating the thing it's also kind of frustrating because it makes our heroes just like what what was the terminator's plan what was yeah, the resistance's that's plan? what i'm saying we can't kill it so we just take john away forever and it'll always be hunting him for all time and Even he wasn't still seeking today. out anything that seemed to have a permanent effect on it so i just i just didn't understand. I mean, he must yeah. have knowledge. So, um, I, they really did not know how to kill. They didn't have any plan. And like when it was finally frozen, why did you shoot it? That made it. That put it into smaller pieces, which would be warmed <laughs> by the hot yeah. metal near it. Like, yeah, you you're right. Picked it you're up right. and walked away with it. it Taking him longer to thaw. Yeah, that's a yeah, really that's the worst, point. stupidest thing you could have done, Arnie. If he just picked him up. And taken him Austin. to the hot metal and dropped him in, movie over. You don't even need to get stabbed or lose your arm or anything. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, it made it feel like they didn't have a plan, which was cool-ish, because it's kind of authentic. But it would have been really great if we don't have a plan, aside from to run away, turned into, wait a minute, the T-1000 is immortal. The T-1000 can't die. The T-1000 is designed to kill John Connor. When is the next time it will be certain about where John Connor is? Mm -hmm. When he fades Skynet. So we flash, flash of the future in the last scene, like, well, we never killed the T-1000, but we did run away, like, <laughs> and he dies right there when he's about to break in and send Kyle Reese back. T-1000 <laughs> wins. Skynet Speaking forever. of, you mentioned Thing earlier. I did appreciate the Thing reference um, when they... when There they, was a Thing reference. Yeah, when he gets all hacked up and his head is up in the air like that. Yep. Yeah. Is the Thing yeah. reference? Did you catch the Shining reference? Where was the Shining reference? Ah, uh, you didn't. Yeah. Okay. So in yeah. Miles Dyson's apartment, whenever they first go into it, there's a camera on the floor at kid on a, a three-wheeler level tracking that kid as he goes through the <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, okay. it's a okay. Shining oh, reference. Nice. I, I oh, saw that and I was like, oh my god! That's pretty funny. That's, That's great. I wonder if there are more. There must be more horror there, movies. There are. Yeah. There's there's lots of little nods and winks in this movie to stuff okay. like that. Um, but great. that one I caught and I was like, ooh, you sneaky son of a bitch! I yeah. know what that's referencing. But yeah, another another. If we're gonna get into the, like the nitpicks, I do have one more nitpick I could pull out, which is that <laughs> when after they leave Dyson's place to go to Cyberdyne, is there? I mean. There was no debate about John Connor going on what was essentially a suicide mission. I'm like, you would think you would think that uh, Sarah Connor, at the very least, would have had an argument about it. Yeah. Right? But it's just like, you know, it's like I, I'm just like, wow, you're really going all in on this risk. It's all yeah, she, gives him, she gives him duct tape to, you know, to help them. You know, it's uh, yeah. yeah, that was the other thing is, 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 is as, the, as they're doing that, he pulls out the duct tape and is clearly the one that's been designated to put the duct tape on his mouth. So that means there was a conversation before they went in where mm. they're set they're you know, they give him the duct tape and that's his role in the operation, which kind of makes him an accessory, right? Like that's like, it involves yeah. him in a way it wouldn't if he was just a kid who was with his mom while she's committing a crime. Um, yeah. I, I think that part of the reason he's there and there's not a lengthy debate is because the debate in the movie already kind of happened. She already, yeah, I know. Too important. And he no, already no. kind of won her over. He went to her trying to assassinate Miles Dyson just in time to save her humanity. She's realizing that he's grown. He's growing into that's, the man that, that she's going to have to allow to not just be protected by his mom, you know? That's why I'm making it a nitpick and not a serious complaint yeah, about the movie. Because I realized having that argument twice in the movie would have been like, it would have been uh, you're just reiterating the same, the same, same, I same conflict. I I really like Dyson in this movie too. I oh, he's cool, man. Yeah, he, yeah. I thought he's a yeah. cool character because it's really well done. Yeah, because they do a really good job of like getting you to want him to go, her to go and assassinate whoever it is that's 
doing all this. And then they yeah. really humanize him in subtle ways. He's, and I just little, thought, yeah. he's like, don't hurt my family. Yeah. Spare them. Well, that, that's me. not so subtle. But the, the, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it was it was it was a sledgehammer. But I remember yeah. being genuinely having a moment of horror during that scene during the first oh, time like I watched Sarah's it. It was like, it, gun, like, Jesus, I'm become the thing I hate. I'm terminating yeah. someone to prevent a timeline. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was, it was effective. It was, oh, was Jesus, really they did become Terminators. They killed yeah. Skynet's mom. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like it, asshole? <laughs> no, it's, yeah, they, they did. It, it's, it's, a, it's, uh, but I just thought he did a very good job sort of conveying his humanity in that scene when she's yeah. got the gun pulled on him. Um, and I, I like that, that, I like that he ends up helping them. Do you know what I mean? Because it would have been very uh-huh. easy to go another direction and have him be, like, well, no, I'm going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm the evil scientist or whatever. These crazy yeah. people. No, he's convinced. And his yeah. reaction is, I'm going to be sick. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Well, which might have been from getting shot, too, I would imagine. Well, <laughs> got to be a little bit of that yeah. in there. A little uh, bit of that. It's, uh, yeah. But yeah, he got to, to die a hero. So it was a good little, good little arc he had there. But uh, yeah, no, I thought I thought that was good, and I did like, I, even though, like you said, it was a sledgehammer. I like that they establish he has a family, like that there's a there's a cohesive family life. There is something that adds to the character. Um, yeah, just the fact too that he's hanging on just to let the security guards get out too. It's like yeah, like cops or whatever they were. I forget, but it's just like that was that was a nice touch. It's like you know he could have just dropped it, but it's like yeah, no, I, I he cared about the please. I don't know how long yeah. I can hold this. Well, yeah, it like, also shows like kind of the tragedy of the overall storyline because it yeah it's easier if it's just a bad guy that makes AI technology that runs amok. But he's actually a good guy who just literally sacrificed his life to save people. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And like he went from getting shot by this woman to going on a suicide mission and losing his life with her in the same night because yeah. of the weight of moral responsibility he felt. Dude's yeah. a fucking champion. Yeah. yeah. Even if he'd lived, it's like he was fucking his life up for good at that point. He, he was it, toast. It was, yeah. Yeah. It's but like, knew, yeah, you just don't go in and blow stuff up like that and yeah. walk yeah. away. Well, well, and he yeah, knew exactly. that, that was, it, he had, it had to be done, you know? Yeah. And yeah. there's a real argument that he might have known that he had to die, too. It's like, look, I, the rest of Cyberdyne is in my head. head. Like, yeah. it just, it yeah. is, they do that in the last part of the movie, too. It's like, look, there's still something about Cyberdyne. Like, there's still another yeah. chip. There's still one loose end. And it's yeah. it's heartbreaking in both cases. I, yeah, how did you I, feel about kid, that ending where he says there's as, another as chip? Kid, and... It broke my heart. I loved Arnie so much. <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted my own Arnie dad. Uh, so I really felt for uh, I really felt for John Connor there. And I did too. I mean, I feel for John Connor definitely. I mean, whatever you feel, it's uh, it's yeah, go ahead. I don't mean to cut you off anyway. Oh no, the last thing I wanted to say was final score Terminator Zero, Sarah Connor two. Not bad, Sarah. Not bad at all. <laughs> Lifetime high score of killing Terminators for humanity. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, that, that, it's a very Again, I think that the franchise is weak when it doesn't make her the main character because of the, you know, just the development um, and how the the roots of the franchise go back to her, not to not really to John Connor. He's more of a um, he's more of a figure. He's like a messianic figure in the movie, but not necessarily the person that you want the movies to revolve around. The the only way it could have made John the main character, if, if he was very, very, very much like Sarah Connor. Um, which I again, Salvation, ugh, so close. It could have been that movie. Um, I, I would have liked it. I, I honestly think it, it had a lot of potential. I'm I'm sad about it. It has been a hot minute since I've watched it, and I don't remember <laughs> liking it very much. But I I can feel where it could have been the movie that would have sort of like made this franchise good again. Um, I just it just kind of missed tragically. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They they only kind of go downhill, unfortunately. Um, well, the new ones are hot garbage. Like the, the new ones are very much, are very much Hollywoody, and they are not the, good. The one where John Connor is the bad guy is the one that's most baffling to me. That was the one where I was like, "Wait a second, what's going on here?" The, it just, it just ceased to make any kind of sense. They, of- so I guess the people who wrote that looked at the the fantastic masterpiece, which was the first one, and the flawed but incredibly strong follow-up of this one and said these are movies about time travel but they're not 
These yeah. these are movies about humanity versus the machine. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, that's what they're about at their at their core. They're about yeah. like fate and destiny, and about like doing heroic things in the face of monstrous like apocalyptic finality. Like that's what they're about. They are not time travel movies. They have time travel in them at the very beginning to make the premise happen. But yeah. Mm-hmm. But in the middle of the movie, it's just gobbledygook. It becomes back to the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's not, it's not that kind. It's not about the future. It's not about all these different timelines. It just doesn't work when you, I, I, cause my note about this one was that the, the first movie, the strength of the first movie, it has this emotional core that I feel like the other movies don't have. Um, the second yeah, movie like has a stronger movie. emotional yeah. core than Hot. Uh, once, so once you involve too, oh, sorry, once you involve too much time travel, it just nothing matters anymore. I mm. mean, it's uh, it's like the liquid metal. It just it can be anything we want, whenever we want. There's no stakes. Yeah, you can bring dead people back, whatever. I mean, it's like some people say that about the like the whole multiverse thing in the Marvel movies. It's like, well, now mm-hmm. they want to bring Iron Man back. Yeah, Iron Man died, but there's a million other Iron Man that they can just have show up through a portal. Look, man, yeah. <laughs> multiverse and, and any kind of doppelganger thing, it, it, the fun thing about that isn't that there's more versions. The fun thing is about losing your identity in that. Like, yeah. what is it that makes you uniquely you? And, like, we as human beings, like, there's seven billion of us. We're different. We're individuals. But, like, the broad strokes of us, we're replaceable. We know this about ourselves. We're temporary, replaceable life forms. Some of us, like me, have created our own replacements. Uh, even genetically speaking, like the next generation's there. I'm a, I'm the obsolete model now. That we know that, and so that's an interesting thing to explore psychologically. You know, it's not fun where it's like this is a get out of thinking of a compelling story free card. I want a compelling story. If someone's coming back from the dead, that shit better matter. You know, you know who did it well? Red Dwarf. Red Dwarf did the whole multiverse thing exceedingly well. Oh, man, um, it's, it's one with the, the the guy that's a super evolved cat and everything, right? Yeah, the super. But there's also the character yeah, Arnold Arnold Judas Rimmer, and he has a um uh, uh um, oh, somebody's got a mic that's kind of picking up stuff. Um, yeah, some I just muted. Oh, Adam, I think you're getting some background noise. Um, and they uh uh they have a there we go. Got it. Uh, he has a, a I forget what you call it, but like the the version of him from another universe, Ace Rimmer. But there's like I think actually multiple versions of him that uh, you know appear throughout the the series, I, and I just remember it actually working, even though it was a comedy show. Um, you could do it, like you could do any premise if you do it well. It's whenever you're lazy with it well, that sucks. Well, what was cool about it is he meets, and I it's been years, so I'm probably butchering it. So I apologize <laughs> to the Red Dwarf fans if I got something wrong. It's I, yeah, I literally I apologize have not seen it so sorry. since like maybe 2000. Like that's how far back we're going. Um, yeah. But there's a character called Ace Rimmer, who's another version of him. And it, it turns out that, like, all of the Arnold Rimmers can become Ace Rimmer. Ace Rimmer is, like, a, an ideal that they're all able to strive for. And so the, the, the complete hot mess Rimmer that we meet in the beginning of the series actually becomes one of the Arnold Rimmers. Um, <laughs> so it's a really interesting character evolution. Um, well, yeah, and that's good because it's it's doing something compelling with the premise, you know, Th- this idea yeah. that there's this idealized version of yourself is in this movie with with John Connor, that there's this yeah. kind of this version of him that can do what needs to get done in these dark circumstances. Yeah. Um, and like that's that's interesting. That's a cool premise, you know, really, you were talking about the, the upgrade or the change in Sarah Connor's character. That's another one. The first movie, she's like, I'm not the mother of the hero of the future. Yeah. I'm just some waitress, man. The second movie, she's like, I have a mission that needs to get done. And like, <laughs> it's, it's great because it shows that, yeah, you can become this other version of yourself. That's fascinating. Well, and, and again, yeah. it's, it's, oh, go ahead, Adam. It's just the complexity of it, too. Because, I mean, obviously, her mission is to raise John Connor and prepare for Judgment Day. But but even that, it's like she can't live with the fact this nuclear war is going to happen. And so she goes off mission because just the yeah. horror. Every, she's just got this. It's like it's not it's not enough to know that her son's going to save the world in the future. It's just she can't stand the fact of all these innocent people around her getting killed. And it it it, it, it that's that's just a great great conflict to give her in this movie well it is interesting because the first movie ends and it's kind of like 
they succeeded, humanity is saved, but actually they're still doomed to go through this horrible apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. And the vast you know, majority of humanity is yeah. not saved. Yeah, so it's it's, it, it, it does yeah. do a good job of like highlighting that. Through Sarah's yeah. dialogue in the movie, where she's like, "You're all dead. You're already dead." Like she really yeah. kind of loses it, but it, well, it works really well because um, she's so sweet and like mm-hmm. she's a she's a real grounded person in the first movie. She really she's got a big heart, mm-hmm. you know. And take a person like that and make it a known fact to them that everyone they are going to meet for the rest of their life is just a body bag. They are one yeah. of the skulls on the giant hill of skulls that the Terminators mm-hmm. crush in the beginning of the movie. Like yeah. they, they're gone. Like, yeah. and it's up to her to save what little will ever remain. Well, Jesus. The good, uh, yeah, yeah I, I can see why they put her in an insane asylum in this movie. Well, no, and the other good thing about it is like, you know, people come out of like, nobody would come out of that first movie in real life and be an intact human being. They'd be really, uh, you know, shaken. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so uh, I just think that this movie does a very believable job of, showing like an evolution towards strength while still retaining you know just the you know the badness that comes with uh with oh yeah sort it, of thing. it's a so. it's beautifully nuanced in that regard and it makes it it gives the first of all it gives the actors who have incredible talent a lot to do uh yeah even characters like as as much as we're, we're kind of cracking jokes at arnie's expense with all his little one-liners and things like that in this movie this is still a good performance from Arnold. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I want, like I mm-hmm. still liked the last action hero and all that stuff, but it's just it's just that it every every actor reaches a point where they have a shtick and it kind of starts to get old after a while. And I feel like this is the movie where it started to get old, and it also I can see it. Yeah, yeah they kind of boxed him in even more after this. I mean, he still had good movies. True Lies was good, and you know, I, again, I think Last Action Hero was good. But um, and I have to look at the timeline of his films to see what. But I don't think Last were. Action Hero did that well. I think people that was like I think I think True Lies did it do well. I, I don't maybe I'm True Lies I think did well, but Last Action True Hero kind of got panned. I think when it came out. Yeah, uh, I think which is yeah, tragic. Were, That's I know it, it's remembered it's fondly. The quality of the movie, but it's it's it, basically yeah. the public was like, all right, another Arnie movie, whatever, and they didn't even look at yeah. it. Yeah, it yep. became a cult classic, I think, over time, but. Um, mm-hmm. But it's one of those movies where when it was released, it was actually it was like a really clever premise. It should have on paper. It looked great. But I think it was just one of those things where people like him, people like Sylvester Stallone, they were struggling a little bit more in the 90s because the 90s was not about that kind of action hero. So, um, no, by Jingle All the Way, he was just a joke. It was like he was a punchline by that point, which is kind of unfair. But you know what? The good thing is, like with people like that and like with anything in culture, everything does kind of become a joke, but then yeah. that too passes and people go yeah. back and look at the, you know, the, the, the work and it, it's, it's remembered, you know, yeah, a, more fair. A critical evaluation of his films, even the goofy ones like Jingle All the Way reveals some real talent in them. You yeah. Know, like, oh, he's massively talented. Value. So I think, I yeah. a friend of mine called me the other day and he was like, wow, I just watched The Running Man for the first time in 30 mm-hmm. years. And that is a great movie. And I'm like, yes, oh, it is. Fantastic. <laughs> People like to make fun Best of him because of his Hoban accent. That Paul Verhoeven didn't they, touch. They make yeah. fun of him because of his accent. And, they, and I, the thing I don't like that people do is they say he sounds dumb because of his accent. But he's oh. actually like a really he's smart so guy. Smart. Oh, yeah. yeah no, the yeah, guy's so, much smarter than me. <laughs> like, as evidenced by the fact that before he became a millionaire movie star, he was already a millionaire. Like, yeah. people forget that about him. He he succeeded early in life in one of the most, like, he was Mr. Universe, and he was in the, the armed forces, and he succeeded in both of those. And then he became a, a real estate mogul, long from a millionaire, and then he became a movie star. Then he became the governor of California. The man is brilliant and multi-talented. Like, he does yeah. not sound dumb. You and sound also, dumb for calling him dumb. He became like a massive star with like all of the all of the things people make fun of him for would have all been considered handicaps. Do you know what I mean? Like they would have all been things like if if you or I went to like Germany and tried to become stars, you know, presuming we had talent and tried to become stars with like really heavy American accents, it would probably be a hurdle, right? But unless you're be- David Hasselhoff. Yeah, David, yeah, yeah. but he's got the name. I think the name gives him a little. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In he's got the ancestry. Yeah. He's a and Knight Rider. Knight Rider. Knight Rider was, you know, is like quite a resume piece to, you know. <laughs> to, oh, yeah. 
God, I want to I, see I don't know if people realize what a big show that was when it aired, but oh, that was God. like my favorite yeah. show as a kid. And it yeah, was me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and just and, and it was and just now the heartbreak. I can talk to my car. It's amazing. Yeah. The heartbreak <laughs> of, of never finding a car that could talk in real life was uh, it's but, come true for me. It's so good. Living the dream, Adam. Living the dream. If you don't call it kid, it doesn't count. Yeah, it's just not the same. Like series is yeah. not the same, and you know the, the GPS things are not the same. You can no, you can not. you can give them funny accents to like you know give them more character or whatever, but they're just not. Just you know. lacks the wry sense of humor of Kit. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. Yeah, cause I, I wasn't Kit voiced by the guy from um, Boy Meets World. Wasn't he the teacher on Boy Meets World? I Am I don't no. I was just wondering that. I'm like, who did voice Jesus. Kit? I gotta look that up. I'm pretty sure yeah, it was him. Yeah. Uh, I've actually been kind of disappointed. I finally have a phone good enough I can talk to it and it talks back. And then, I don't know, it seems like it's like a little moralizing busybody. Like every time I try to have a little, poke a little fun at its expense or do, do a little edge, it's like, well, here's an explanation for why this is the, it like it links me to some Wikipedia article <laughs> about like ethical integrity. And I'm like, dude, like chill. I don't need a moral lesson right now. I'm trying to crack wise with my robot sidekick. It's like, do you not know how to do that? They, they're so humorless, you know? Like, wow. We My wife is stuff. always yelling at Siri all the time. She gets really <laughs> fed up with her. Um, and you are correct. It was the guy see? from Boy Meets World. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Feeney. You can hear it because he's got a very distinct voice. You know what I mean? So I never actually looked that up. I just assumed I, that that was I don't actually case. know what Boy nice. Meets World is. So I, I, I... It, was, it was a really <laughs> bad show. And um, I only remember one episode because I didn't like it. But there was an episode where... I remember he teach he he teaches the guy the 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 main character history by uh, I think he shows him like uh, something about the Sandwich Islands and and oh, he, and, he, and and then he's like oh you like you know like doesn't that sound familiar and he's like oh yeah the sandwich he's like well where do you think that came you know is that kind of a thing where he gives him like a, you know something that yeah. would appeal to me as a kid you know that kind I of I see that was ninety three to two thousand it ran so yeah. yeah that was way outside yeah. my. So, yeah, I was in high school at the time, so I only saw like a couple of episodes, probably. Um, yeah, those things that kind of got. I, I would see episodes of Boy Meets World incidentally, but I wouldn't yeah. really ever yeah. look for it. Well, the guy that played the main character was Fred Savage's little brother, and I don't remember him being that interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. No, I was running a game store with Rob in those years, so I was okay. Times, some yeah. kid shows. So but, weird how many Bobs run game stores. Like, well, Bob is a very common name, you know. It's a... But they never go by Bob. It's always Rob. Actually, he went by Bob back then. He's a, oh, okay. a Rob. Yeah, I've, I've, he's a I've had during those years. He's he's a pretty easygoing Robert. He'll go with any of the different names. I feel it's. A, yeah, um, my, my grandpa's name was to Robert too. To like he always went by Bob, but he insisted that he was spelling it backwards. He was a character, my guy. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. My, my dad's name is Robert. And he goes by Bob. So, yeah. I, um, but, or if his dad was talking to him, Bobby. But that's giant about Austrians. It. I find, who, yeah. Who LARP is being idiots. My, my grandfather was German and he was very, very tall. He's one of those very large uh, varieties of German man. And, um, well, he was German ancestor. He was born and raised like somewhere in the Midwest. So, like, he, he wasn't like. Culturally. But there's like a lot of Ger there were a lot of German settlers in the Midwest, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So his his parents were like I think they were like first or second gen, mm -hmm. um, but like, but he loved like playing up because people would see the size of this man, they would kind of assume he was an idiot. I think because he was he was he was slow and deliberate in the way he did things. One of the smartest, shrewdest minds I've ever met. Like he was brilliant, but he loved playing dumb. So he would just go <laughs> up to people and just be like, "My name is Bob." I can spell it. Listen, B O O B. You just grin. You're painting a very interesting picture. Um. I, want to, I want people to know that there's a very fascinating origin story to me. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Anything else on the uh, on Terminator before we sign out, guys? Is there? Uh, I I continue to champion this movie i i'm surprised that it is a silver medal i honestly thought i was going to come back to it after watching the first one and be like see the first one's dated and this one this one's like got more stuff and, and like nah 
I, I'm, I've been won over to your side. I do think that uh, I do think the first Terminator is definitely the artistically better movie. It's more thoroughly realized, it's sharper. Uh, its character beats are, are they hit deeper and harder. But I actually really like this movie still. There's a lot to recommend it's, it. Yeah. I like you guys. I just I'm entertained every time I watch it. It's a rare movie that can entertain me every single time I watch it. Well, okay. I guess if it's a James Cameron movie, I'm usually entertained every time I watch it. Yeah. But for, for the most I, part, I don't. I don't ever want to see The Abyss again. I am like The Abyss. I was wondering about that actually. I was like, yeah. I, I haven't watched The Abyss since I thought in the theater. I was like, man, I. We, I we watched, watched the Titanic the, before I watched The Abyss again. The, uh, uh, I've seen the Titanic a lot, so I would probably watched The Abyss first, but. It's been a hot minute since Abyss. And not everything he does is gold. Like, I saw those Avatar movies, and though those are, in my opinion, very okay. entertaining movies. They aren't really rewatchably entertaining. Yeah, like, that's the I don't want to see no. Avatar again. I, I wouldn't mind seeing the next Avatar, Way of Fire, or whatever it's going to be called. But, like, I don't want to see the second one again, even though I enjoyed the whole film, you know? I just so, want just... to make something like Anim Aliens or t1 again you know like that's yeah. the, i want to see him do another movie like that again um, yeah. I, I gotta watch aliens again i was thinking about that the whole time we were talking uh -huh. about, i gotta watch aliens i haven't seen aliens in forever I, wish, I just wish i could watch the real version of aliens again that's the only reason i don't yeah. go back to aliens yeah. much is it's just Where like you find the theatrical version of Aliens. you have to get the physical media version usually to do that and sometimes you still can't um it's it's, it's, it's yeah it's really again, it, it, Aliens. I'd say like takes a big hit, but the, but Amadeus is like the much worse. Like Amadeus is ruined by the changes. Mm -hmm. um, That's a tragedy. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you can always fast forward through the uh, insert part on the colony in Aliens. I guess so. Uh, it's uh, it's it's more redeemable than uh, than, than some movies with that stuff put in. But yeah, my last thought is I just want to thank Joel for making us watch this again because it it really. Yeah. I really did remember how much I liked the early part of the movie and my problems with it are mainly nitpicks. It's, it's just, there's I mean, the fact we've talked about this so long, even it's flaws are interesting flaws. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a very, very worthwhile watch. So yeah, I'm happy we did this. So yeah, and so I, 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 I had a so good time bad. watching it. I, you know, I get my thoughts, obviously I still, stand by what i said but I, it was it's an enjoyable movie um yeah. and i think i think you know and also it's it as much as it sometimes annoys me because the first one was so good it is a good companion piece to the first movie and that there's a, a lot of room to talk about things and all this stuff so there is that um yeah i just i just i, I mean I, to me the first movie is just so perfect in like mm -hmm. And how it feels in the emotional element, in the love story, in the the gritty action aspect of it, how it's all dark and largely done at night. And the tone is just perfect and the music is perfect. Um, and this one, you know, uh, it's got a Guns N' Roses song in it, which is a perfectly <laughs> fine song, but it feels kind of weird. And it's got bad to the bone and stuff like that. And. And again, I feel like this is the movie that they're largely making fun of when they do the last action hero and they're talking about the music in the background and all that stuff. I feel like that's kind of this is the movie that really uh, a lot of that is coming from. Um, yeah, but yeah, I do so like it, in Terminator Salvation that he still has his Guns N' Roses music. I think that's cool. <laughs> that's a that's a highlight. Uh, I like Guns N' Roses. I liked it in the soundtrack. Oh, yeah. I, like I mean, that. I liked Guns N' Roses, too. I just, um, I yeah. don't know. I just don't need them in Terminator. They they have to, what's the what's the this term one. you use when a character is hearing the same music that we're hearing? I always forget this term. I'm diegetic. sure Joel will. Yeah. What was it? Diegetic. I had it caught on Yeah. Loaded. Guns N' Roses as a diegetic element in the movie would have worked. But yeah. I think as a background soundtrack that's where it may be like if they had gone and if, if when they went into that I, bar guns and roses was on the stage that singing, you could be mine. Uh, yeah i would have been cool with that um yeah i would have liked bad to the bone to have not been there and guns and roses to have been there mostly because yeah. even if you are ignoring the fact that they gave away the twist in the trailer that gives away the twist that that the terminator is not the bad guy it's the cop yeah. that's the bad guy well also that, have you ever listened to the lyrics of Bad to the Bone? Like, like really listen to them? 
It's yeah, it's, of course it's, I have. Yeah, okay. So it, George Thorogood, like you can't it, help but hear every syllable of every word the man says. But I feel like it's one of these songs that all anybody really remembers is bad to the bone. Do you know what I mean? And they don't the the story it starts itself with being is, bored and all the nurses going, Ooh, that that baby, that's a bad baby. Yeah. It's a parody song from conception. Uh, but well, that's the other thing that's it is a parody song, and that's yeah, the part that because he's yeah. making fun of that culture, yeah. Like, yeah. The, it's George Thorogood, so he kind of pulls it off, you know, yeah. Um, but much like must, much like most things that genuinely mock something and do it with incredible panache and skill, it becomes the crowned king of that culture. It is the monster that defies. But the I think rules of the I monster. think that's it's, what makes it so weird. It's because that's a set. It is a parody song, so it's almost it's not the same, but it's almost like having a Weird Al song or having Hello Mother, Hello Father. I forget the name of that song. Well, but you know what I'm talking about. It's uh, also the timing too. But yeah, Back to the pronounce. Bone was an older song to the point where it was, you know, there's that it's you know, we talk about Arnie, there's how Arnie went through that dip and then was reappraised. Yep. Bad to the Bone was in the dip phase at that point. It had been so overused in the yeah. 80s. You know, whereas Guns N' Roses was still pretty new. That was late yeah. 80s music and that was still fresh. So if but it was that was when Use Your Illusion came out too. So that was kind of Oh, uh, that was really, yeah. Yeah, you're right. We are in '91, aren't we? Yeah, because that was that song yeah. was the. I think that was the first single from "Use Your Illusion," and we were like massively anticipating "Use Your Illusion." Yeah, I, I remember. I remember watching the ads for this, and watching <laughs> clips on MTV where I, Arnold is talking about how he got them to do this song, and then I remember yeah. getting "Use Your Illusion," and and it's a. Don't get me wrong; it's a good album. But it's it's not Appetite for Destruction, right? No, like it's, it's Appetite a, for Destruction stayed in my Walkman for about an entire year yeah. on my bus rides to school. Whereas Same. I didn't even buy Use Your Illusion. I mean, I I liked it okay, but I I never actually physically bought I, a copy of it. I yeah, bought both. Well, I bought Use Your Illusion. Like that was her go-to. But like, man, having listened to them both recently, Appetite for Destruction blows yeah. away. It's yeah. so much. It's it's all so much more cohesive. You know what it is? Appetite for Destruction is like T one, and Use Your Illusion is like T two. It is. Yeah. That's the You're perfect, right. Yeah. yeah. Perfect comparison. <laughs> so, and and I think that's why I so like not just them being on the soundtrack, but that's why I so strongly associate those things and why yeah. it's just yeah. i don't know i just i just get this sinking feeling whenever i think of t1 or t1 t2 well, because of i i remember being that age and anticipating the movie and the movie coming out and anticipating user illusion and user and then all of the stuff that unfolded over the next few years yeah. um yeah, and use your illusion had a lot of the same issues that this had, where there were moments of incredible brilliance in it. Yeah, like, there, like yeah. November Rain is one of my favorite of all time. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful, that's a song. really fun song. Um, I have to say, but yeah. a lot of it's indulgent. Um, yeah, it's a little flabby. We, it's unfocused. You know, we don't need it. It, We don't need the Bob Dylan cover. We don't need the um, what's the other one? The uh, 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 now, that's a good cover, but like, I but we don't need it. Yeah, I think with the user illusion to the timing, it was like that form of rock was just starting to die too. Yeah, it's like yeah. for me, for me, November Rain is like the final swan song of like yeah. classic rock and roll. Yeah. It's like after that, it's like it's done. It's like there's November Rain and okay, it's it's over. Well, yeah, and then like you know, <laughs> uh, that's never mind came absolutely. out and you know and what? Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, never mind hit like right yeah. around that time and it was a Music new kind of rock you know? yeah so but anyways you know you know we had this trip down nostalgia lane and we talked <laughs> Our about musical yeah you know yeah, little... yeah we should call this old men yelling at clouds that should be the uh <laughs> name of the show. Uh, yeah. so so anyways we'll uh we'll we'll let everybody go and we'll be back we don't know what we're going to talk about next if we're going to resume horror express or if we're going to finally get back to Busha weekend because i really want to do we've been threatening to do crouching tiger I, for so long on that you know that, yeah. uh, to put the plug in at the end like i always do the the hard the hardback version of my game the pod is coming out uh so getting back into doing Wusha stuff totally on brand for me right now got all these all these blu-rays to review that i bought yeah look at that oh, 
Adam, if you want to review those, I will watch yeah. the movies yeah, that are available. Let's make a, I, you know what? I that's what we them. should do. Let's let's go on a wuxia bender. Let's make a make us a list, Adam. I'd love to review some movies. I would, I've never read any wuxia movies with Joel, so I'm well, I'm, oh, on, you're right. I'm on board. With this. We can do it as a wuxia workshop episode. Yeah. Okay. Workshop. I'm in. All right. So we'll head out, and until next time, we will talk to you later. Bye.